Poems to a Listener, Readings and Conversation with Contemporary Poets. The Mechanist. Advancing with a self-denying gaze, he looks closely at the love-divining daisy. Since none but persons may of persons learn, the frightened plant denies herself in turn and sways away as if to flee her fears, clashing her flower heads like clumsy gears. Welcome, I'm Henry Lyman, and in this half-hour program we'll be visiting poet Richard Wilbur and listening to selections I asked him to read from his new and collected poems published by Harcourt Brace Jovanovich. In the poem we just heard, a daisy is being examined by a mechanist, someone who believes that phenomena can be explained in terms of matter and physical law and nothing else. He feels that um, it's necessary to see the daisy as far as possible with a, an eye which merely uh, registers and uh, measures and reduces the object as nearly as possible to mathematics. And uh, that's what he's doing. He's reifying a daisy, depriving it of uh, its right to be a person, in the process depriving himself of personhood so that the man and the daisy can't commune. The plant uh, sways away and becomes reduced to a thing. And to a machine. Under the mechanist's eye. Uh, she clashes her flower heads like clumsy gears. It's an essentially violent thing that's happening here. I mean... Oh, yes. It's, very, it's a very violent it's, act. It's, that, it's uh, small scale, but, but very violent, involving the, an, the partial annihilation of two things. Both the mechanist and the daisy itself. Yes. On the eyes of an SS officer... I think of Amundsen, enormously bit by arch-dark flurries on the ice plateaus, an amorist of violent virgin snows at the cold end of the world's spit, or a Bombay saint a squat in the marketplace, eyes gone from staring the sun over the sky, who still dead reckons that acetylene eye, an eclipsed mind, in a blind face. But this one's iced or ashen eyes devise foul purities, in flesh their wilderness, their fire. I ask my makeshift god of this, my opulent bric-a-brac earth, to damn his eyes. Amundsen, the Norwegian explorer who first reached the South Pole, finds his perfection in ice and snow, and um, the Bombay saint finds a kind of perfection in contemplating the sun. It burns his brains out, but he doesn't do any harm to anybody yes. else. It's at anyway. no cost to anybody else. Right. I think that's yeah. the point. But what about the uh, SS officer? What's his the problem? The SS officer's dreams of purity have to do with subjecting everything to the state, and I suppose there are conceptions of racial purity also in his mind. And so his kind of extremism, absolutism, his quest for purity is horrifying, and the poem rejects him in the name of a god who is... Uh, makeshift. <laughs> makeshift, <laughs> who is um, uh, devoted, I suppose, to variety and uh, brings the rain upon the just and the unjust. <laughs> yes, this god is, is a god of a bric-a-brac earth. Yes. Uh, opulent bric-a-brac earth. Yes, this world, thank heavens, is not tidy. <laughs> this is a, a more recent poem called A Finished Man. It's a poem about ill-motivated philanthropy. Of the four louts who threw him off the dock, three are now dead, and so more faintly mock the way he choked and splashed and was afraid. His memory of the fourth begins to fade. 
It was himself whom he could not forgive. Yet it has been a comfort to outlive that woman, stunned by his appalling gaff, who, with a napkin, half suppressed her laugh. Or that grey colleague, surely gone by now, who, turning toward the window, raised his brow, embarrassed to have caught him in a lie. All witness darkens, eye by dimming eye. Thus he can walk today with heart at ease through the old quad, escorted by trustees, to dedicate the monumental gym a grateful college means to name for him. Seated, he feels the warm sun sculpt his cheek as the young president gets up to speak. If the dead die, if he can but forget, if money talks, he may be perfect yet. He wants to make himself into an image of a perfect man. Yes. Uh, almost a kind of idol. That's and, why. Uh, I, that's why I like the word "sculpt" yeah. in the last stanza. There, he's he's wanting to be turned into a statue by this mm -hmm. dedicatory occasion in which he's involved. Just as the um, young president gets up to eulogize him, he feels the sun sculpting his cheek. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and I suppose that, as my friend Pierre Schneider once pointed out, uh, satire always has a confessional quality. We couldn't attack somebody else as this as vigorously as this poem attacks and shames its subject uh, if we weren't familiar with uh, what we were attacking, weren't familiar in a personal way. I do think that the desire to escape from everything humiliating in one's past and become perfect in the present is probably commoner than humanity will acknowledge. <laughs> Statues. These children playing at statues fill the gardens with their shrillness. In a planned and planted grove they fling from the swinger's hand across the giddy grass and then hold still in gargoyle attitudes, as if all definition were outrageous. Then they melt in giggles and begin again. Above their heads the maples with a stiff compliance entertain the air in abrupt gusts, losing the look of trees in rushed and cloudy metamorphoses, their shadows all a brilliant disrepair, a wash of dodging stars through which the children weave and then again undo their fickle zodiacs. It is a view lively as Ovid's chaos, and its rich uncertainty compels the crowd. Two nuns regard it with habitual love, moving along a path as mountains move or seem to move when traversed by a cloud. The soldier breaks his iron pace, linked lovers pause to gaze, and every roll relents until the feet begin to stroll or stride again. But settled in disgrace upon his bench, one aging bum, brought by his long evasion and distress into an adamantine shapelessness, stares at the image of his kingdom come. The children have a particular effect on those who surround them, on the people looking on. Um, People in general have to take one shape or another. <laughs> if we don't, it will go hard with us. <laughs> but, um, of course, we always regret all of the decisions we make which prevent us from being everything and everybody. And I suppose to contemplate children engaged in a game which makes mock of definition is a kind of relief uh, for people who have taken shape. Yeah. It, it allows them to relent. Yes, I think that's what's going on in this poem, and of course the bum at the close of it... Well, he's uh, a more serious character. In he's a more serious character. He's someone who's, in an adamantine way, uh, 
refused to take shape. Well, he's frozen. He's frozen in his shapelessness. That's right. That's, I suppose, the concluding paradox of the poem. And I think it's a very true thing about people, that if they won't take shape, they nevertheless will take shape in some unhappy way. To some extent in your poetry, you celebrate a certain dishevelment and disorder and shapelessness. Yet, you do this in extraordinarily shapely poems. Do you, do you sense any contradiction there? I don't think there's any contradiction, Henry. It seems to me that in the matter of uh, form versus vitality, if those are opposites, um, one doesn't have to vote for one. Uh, it seems to me that I and, uh, and all poets and all people are interested in arriving at a, a suitable balance uh, between uh, uh, order and flexibility, between simplicity and variety. Balance. Yes, and I hope, I hope that my, my poems are both orderly, as you say, and at the same time quite conspicuously threaten to tear themselves apart hmm. uh, at this or that uh, moment. Like the children playing at statues. Exactly. The Ride. The horse beneath me seemed to know what course to steer through the horror of snow I dreamed, and so I had no fear. Nor was I chilled to death by the wind's white shudders, thanks to the veils of his patient breath and the mist of sweat from his flanks. It seemed that all night through, within my hand no rain, and nothing in my view but the pillar of his mane, I rode with magic ease at a quick unstumbling trot through shattering vacancies on into what was not, till the weave of the storm grew thin with a threading of cedar smoke and the ice-blind pain of an inn shimmered and I awoke. How shall I now get back to the inn-yard where he stands, burdened with every lack, and waken the stable hands to give him, before I think that there was no horse at all, some hay, some water to drink, a blanket and a stall? Is this poem derived from a dream you actually had? Yes, this is a pretty straightforward report on a dream I had a few years ago and also on how I felt when I woke up. The dream was still very much with me. Mm. I still felt very painfully that I owed something to the horse. But you wanted to get back to that inn yard? wanted to get back and make sure that the horse was taken care of before I ceased to believe in the horse at all. The ending is very tantalizing because you juxtapose the image of the horse, or the memory of the horse, with the picture of no horse at all. Yes, that, I trust that that line, that there was no horse at all, has a rather violent effect. Um, for me, this dream is a deep dream. <laughs> and uh, and a, a dream in which one encounters strength and is given strength. By the horse, by the journey itself. Mm -hmm. Piccola Commedia. He is no one I really know, the sun-charred, gaunt young man by the highway's edge in Kansas 30-odd years ago. On a tourist cabin veranda, Two middle-aged women sat, one in a white dress, fat, with a rattling glass in her hand, called, Son, don't you feel the heat? Get up here into the shade. Like a good boy, I obeyed, and was given a crate for a seat, and an orange crush and gin. This state, she said, is hell. Her thin friend cackled, Well, dear, you gotta fight sin with sin. No harm in a drink, my stars, said the fat one, jerking her head, and I'll take no lip from Ed, him with his damn cigars. Laughter. A combine whined on past, and dry grass bent in the backwash. Liquor went like an ice pick into my mind. 
Beneath her skirt I spied two sea cows on a flow. Go talk to Mary Jo, son. She's reading a book inside. As I gangled in at the door, a pink girl curled in a chair looked up with an ingenue stare. Screenland lay on the floor. Amazed by her starlet's pout and the way her eyebrows arched, I felt both drowned and parched. Desire leapt up like a trout. Hello, she said, and her gum gave a calculating crack. At once from the lightless back of the room there came the grumble of someone heaving from bed, a zippo's click and flare. Then, more and more apparent, the shuffling form of Ed, who neither looked nor spoke, but moved in profile by, blinking one jellied eye in his elected smoke. This is something I've never told, and some of it I forget, but the heat, I can feel it yet, and that conniving cold. This could just be a scene set in Kansas, but the title, Piccola Commedia, Little Comedy, suggests that we're someplace else. I think it um, is meant to be a, uh, a slice of life on the bum, <laughs> and uh, at the same time, it's meant to have the hellish undertones that the title Piccola Commedia would suggest. I think it's a comic poem, and at the same time, it's a perfectly serious poem, uh, in my mind, about uh, conniving, about the word which uh, jumps out at you from that last line. It's about, about these dreadful compacts we make with each other, whereby I close my eyes to your shortcomings and you close your eyes to mine, and neither of us improves. <laughs> <laughs> Two voices in a meadow. The two voices are a milkweed and a stone, and the milkweed speaks first. Anonymous as cherubs over the crib of God, white seeds are floating out of my burst pod. What power had I before I learned to yield? Shatter me, great wind, I shall possess the field. And the stone says, As casual as cow dung under the crib of God, I lie where chance would have me, up to the ears in sod. Why should I move? To move befits a light desire. The sill of heaven would founder did such as I aspire. The imagery in this poem is primarily Christian, but um, in some ways it's a Buddhist poem, it seems to me. The milkweed and the stone, in a way, are like two Buddhist monks, each trying to achieve a kind of nirvana in, in a different way. Um, <laughs> they certainly are contrasting figures, each looking for, uh, if not nirvana, some kind of peace. The stone may sound like a slob, but I think he's quite as saintly as the milkweed is, and uh, is uh, quite ready to uh, be the humblest possible part of the structure of reality, to be... Uh, supporting the sill of heaven rather than uh, figuring largely in it. <laughs> but aren't they both trying to, um, to achieve the same ends? Something uh, like it, by different paths, I should think. They're speaking out of different natures. But I trust one as much as I trust the other. <laughs> A summer morning... Her young employers, having got in late from seeing friends in town and scraped the right front fender on the gate, 
will not, the cook expects, be coming down. She makes a quiet breakfast for herself. The coffee pot is bright, the jelly where it should be on the shelf. She breaks an egg into the morning light, then with the bread knife lifted, stands and hears the sweet efficient sounds of thrush and catbird, and the snip of shears, where in the terraced backward of the grounds a gardener works before the heat of day. He straightens for a view of the big house ascending stony grey out of his beds mosaic with the dew. His young employers having got in late, he and the cook alone receive the morning on their old estate, possessing what the owners can but own. There's, there's something very special about the fact that the gardener and the cook receive the morning on their old estate. Yes, receive is what you usually expect the, the owners to do. You, you call, you pay a call, and they receive you. And uh, I transfer the verb to the cook and the gardener because, as this poem says, they are the real proprietors <laughs> and enjoyers of the place. And there's a suggestion also that since they, it's their old estate, they've been there for a very long time, perhaps forever, uh, whereas the owners are newcomers. Um. These young people are, though they technically have the deed to the property, are really too busy to know it and enjoy it. And they do seem to be, although the poem gives no evidence, they do seem to be late comers. <laughs> The cook and the gardener seem to have been there for a longer time. Perhaps they came with the place. Yeah. Worlds. For Alexander, there was no far east, because he thought the Asian continent ended with India. Free Cathay, at least, did not contribute to his discontent. But Newton, who had grasped all space, was more serene. To him it seemed that he'd but played with a few shells and pebbles on the shore of that profundity he had not made. Alexander tried to possess what uh, he knew of the world, or what he thought he knew of the map. But uh, the suggestion is that he remained discontent. And what about Newton? His consciousness of infinite space um, uh, seems to give him a certain serenity. I think so, yes. By the way, the words, a few shells and pebbles on the shore, are from Newton himself. The implication is that those few shells and pebbles are toys, in a way, a comparison being to a, a, a small boy playing playing with shells and pebbles on the shore of, of the infinite. Newton did indeed, by means of certain principles, uh, take possession of all space. Yet those principles were to him merely a few shells and pebbles compared to the grandeur of the creation. His formulations then were mere symbolic representations uh, limited in their own way, as, as toys are? I think that's what he was saying, yeah. yes. Um, what about words and the poet? Oh, I, could readily, um, I could readily apply what you suggest to, to my sense of what poetry is like considered as a creation. I said in one of my poems recently, we create nothing. <laughs> and... Uh, it is true that if you compare uh, our creation to the one in which we live, words may be marvelous to us, but they ain't much by comparison. An event. As if a cast of grain leapt back to the hand, a landscape full of small black birds intent on the far south, convene at some command at once in the middle of the air, at once are gone, with headlong and unanimous consent, from the pale trees and fields they settled on. What is an individual thing? 
They roll like a drunken fingerprint across the sky. Or so I give their image to my soul, until, as if refusing to be caught in any singular vision of my eye, or in the nets and cages of my thought, they tower up, shatter and madden space with their divergences, are each alone swallowed from sight, and leave me in this place, shaping these images to make them stay. Meanwhile, in some formation of their own, they fly me still, and steal my thoughts away. Delighted with myself and with the birds, I set them down and give them leave to be. It is by words and the defeat of words, down sudden vistas of the vain attempt, that for a flying moment one may see by what cross purposes the world is dreamt. The poem speaks of words and the defeat of words. Is it in words and their defeat, then, that, that you somehow uh, reach that flying moment when you can, can see the things, can see the, uh, the blackbirds? Yes, I think the, the blackbirds are most real, most rightly seen at the moment when you've possessed them with clear vision and good words, and at the same time, are most aware that they are getting away. I think of something my son Christopher said when he was very young. Um, I asked both of my sons to see what they would say, what the moon was. And uh, Nathan, who was very small, said, uh, the moon is when it's dark and you have to go to bed. <laughs> Whereas Christopher, who was uh, several years older, said, the moon is, and then he paused helplessly, and then he concluded by saying, the moon is what it is. And of course, everything is what it is, uh, regardless of what we may say about it, regardless of how we may think that we have captured it. It remains itself. Yes. Thank heavens. Hamlin Brook. At the alder darkened brink where the stream slows to a lucid jet, I lean to the water, dinting its top with sweat, and see, before I can drink, a startled inchling trout of spotted near-transparency, trawling a shadow solider than he. He swerves now, darting out to where, in a flicked slew of sparks and glittering silt, he weaves through stream-bed rocks, disturbing foundered leaves, and butts then out of view beneath a sliding glass, crazed by the skimming of a brace of burnished dragonflies across its face, in which deep cloudlets pass, and a white precipice of mirrored birch trees plunges down toward where the azures of the zenith drown. How shall I drink all this? Joy's trick is to supply dry lips with what can cool and slake, leaving them dumbstruck also with an ache nothing can satisfy. Poet Richard Wilbur, reading from his new and collected poems published by Harcourt Brace Jovanovich. I'm Henry Lyman. Thanks for being with us. Poems to a Listener was produced by Henry Lyman in cooperation with WFCR, Amherst, Massachusetts. This program was supported by the Witter Binner Foundation for Poetry and the National Endowment for the Arts.